Let me read a section from the Word of God that we'll look at this morning. I'm reading in Luke 16, beginning in verse 9. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, you may receive, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is and that which is in others, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word. We ask now that you, by your Spirit, will apply it to our hearts and lives. Lord, make clear the parts of this that are a little difficult to understand. And I pray that uh, somehow by your Spirit you will do that. But more than that, I pray that you'll help us once we understand to obey. How remiss we would be if we did not, if we somehow trampled underfoot the grace of the Lord that's been given to us by failing to obey. So bless us in this time as we look into your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And if you haven't already, please take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 16. If you are regular at our church, you know you need to bring your Bible each week. But if you are new with us and uh, we hope you'll be back, please be sure and bring your Bible as we work our way through what the Lord has to say to us. We're in these verses today that uh, talk about money. Um, Verboten subject in some people's minds, I think in God's mind, it's a very hot topic. And so we ought to pay attention. An evangelist was uh, one of these uh, guys that uh, did, you know, did Bible conferences, flew all the way across country to be at a conference for a, a week of meetings. But while he arrived in Boston, his bags arrived in Berlin with his clothing in the bags, so he's in trouble. He ran down to a local thrift shop to see what he could find, (coughs) excuse me, and the thrift owner told him, well, we have some suits that have just come in. Uh, They were bought by a local mortuary for use, and uh, they've never been used, so we could sell those to you. They're clean, they're pressed, there's nothing wrong with them, although they were intended to be used for the dead people. The guy said, look, I'm desperate, I'll take two of them. So he took the suits, went back to his hotel room, he tried them on, and he got his wallet and started to stick it in his pocket. No pocket. So he thought, well, I'll stick it in the front. No front pocket. No side pockets. No pockets anywhere. And it suddenly dawned on him. You can't take it with you, right? (laughs) You can't take it with you. So there's no use to put, for a corpse to have pockets. But I'll tell you what you can send it on ahead. And that's what Jesus wants to tell us about today. You can send it on ahead. If you were with us last week, you'll remember that we saw this parable of the unfaithful manager, the man who had wasted somehow the products and the work of his owner. And so he was fired, but before he left, he was to give a final accounting. Rather than give the final accounting, he took advantage of the opportunity to go offer discounts to the loans of the people who owed money to his master in order to ingratiate himself with those who had owed money so that he would have somewhere to go. He could go to their homes. He could find uh, sustenance for himself in the future. Now, the Lord, as we looked at that, we saw the Lord did not commend him for his crookedness. In fact, he acknowledges that he was a dishonest man. But he commends him for his shrewdness. Notice what he says in verse 8. He said, For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. What Jesus is saying and what the point of that parable was, here's a fully developed, unrighteous man living according to the ways of this world, according to the way it operates, according to its principles, 
using any resources he can get his hands on to secure the only future that he can see the next 20 or 30 years or whatever period of time that he has left in this life. And Jesus is saying, guess what? He's smarter than those who claim to be the sons of God, those who claim to be sons of the kingdom, those who claim to be believers who have an eternal future, and they are doing absolutely nothing to secure eternal reward. This man was wiser than them. But there's good news starting in verse 9. In verse 9, Jesus says, and I tell you. And the word I there is emphatic in the original. You can't see it so much in the English, but it's emphatic in the original. What Jesus is saying, listen, I have something to tell you. You don't have to be ignorant about eternity. I came from eternity. I know how things work there. And here's what I have to tell you that will, I can, I can tell you how to take temporal resources and turn them into eternal returns. Speaking of money, in other words, I can tell you how to take what you already have and make it last forever by sending it on ahead. And so in the verses that follow, which is, which is really, really application verses of the, of the parable that Jesus has just told. He gives three ways, three principles to, that, that, that he wants, to, wants us to know how we can make this happen. One principle is aimed at how we deal with others, one toward how we deal with ourselves, and one toward how we deal with God. So let's look at this beginning in verse 9. What do we do toward others that would allow us to send it on ahead? And the answer is we should prioritize others. Look what he says, I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth. So when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. Now, a couple things to understand before we get into the heart of this. The key motivator there is when it says, notice how it says, so when it fails, when what fails? When money fails. So when is that going to be? Well, we don't know when that's going to be, right? It could be any time. It could be tomorrow. Some of you have been there. I have been. Suddenly there's nothing left. Or it could be at the end of this life. But the point is, it's going to fail at some point in time. Money was not forever. And so it will fail. Sooner or later, it will end and we will not. So Jesus is saying, I want to show you how to handle this and how to prioritize it. Now notice he doesn't, Jesus here calls money un, unrighteous wealth. Why does he do that? We looked last week at the fact that money in and of itself is not inherently wrong, right? Clearly not. Money is simply a means of barter, right? It's a means by which we obtain goods that we need and somebody else obtains services or something from us. But we saw it's the pursuit of money. It's, the, it's, the, it's becoming entangled in money that is the problem. First Timothy 6.10 we looked at where God says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered from the faith and have pierced themselves with many pangs. It's not the money, but it's the love of money. It's the hold that money gets on people that causes it to be unrighteous. It's the craving after money, the pursuit of money that has caused some to even, it says, wander away from the faith. They've left God. God is in the rearview mirror because in their pursuit of money, that's the thing that's most important in their life, and God has been left behind. Perhaps, I think perhaps more than anything in this life, the thing that pulls more people away from God than anything else may be money, right? The love of money, the pursuit of money. It's just so tangible. And so it tends to pull us away from God, and, God, and Jesus is warning against that. Money is like a great magnet that just pulls, it toward, pulls, pulls us toward itself and away from God. So Jesus says... Let me tell you how to sanctify that. 
Let me tell you how to make this unrighteous wealth into righteous wealth. Let me tell you how to make it holy. And the first thing he says is make some forever permanent friends. Now that's kind of a strange thing to say don't we, when, you, when you think, but that's, that's exactly where he goes at the, at the very first. He urges make friends for yourselves by means of, by using this unrighteous wealth. Now what's he suggesting? Well, he's not suggesting that we go out and buy friends, right? He's not suggesting that we be the guy that picks up every tab, that gives the greatest parties in town, you know, we noticed uh, uh, our son Tim, when he was out in Los Angeles, used to work for the Staples Center, and he would get his tickets to the Clippers every once in a while. We'd go down, and after a while, Patty and I noticed that there was this same guy with this same strange hat and all kinds of funny clothes on that sat around, uh, around, always on a front row seat at the games. And after a while, we began to notice as we're watching basketball on television, he's there. He's everywhere. He's in Miami, he's in Los Angeles, he's in Dallas, he's wherever there's a, a playoff basketball game, this guy's there. And we, we, we began to talk to our son, Tim, and he told us, yeah, I, he knew his name, I don't remember what it is, but he made a fortune in real estate. And he loves basketball, so he follows basketball around. But, what, but we noticed the, 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 the players always go up to him and they shake hands with him and everything. We found out why, he gives great parties. He gives parties all the time, everywhere in every town that he goes to. He's got money, you know, that he doesn't know what to do with. He's buying friends. It's not what Jesus is talking about. You don't have to have a funny hat and lots of money to go out and buy friends. Those friends melt away when the money fails, right? Some of you had those kind of friends. Maybe some of you have been that kind of friend, I don't know. Those friends melt away when the money's gone. And Jesus is saying, I want you to have some friends when the money stops. Look at it. So that when it fails, when the money fails, they may receive you. Where? Into the eternal dwellings. Well, where is that? In heaven? In heaven? Jesus is talking about using unrighteous wealth and turning it into righteous wealth that will see others come to faith in Christ and be in heaven. How do we do that? By giving to missions? By doing what we can with our money to make sure that the gospel of Jesus Christ is getting shared so that there will be those in heaven one day who are joyful to be there and Every opportunity they have to see us, they tell us, thank you for giving so that I would be here. That's what he's talking about. You, listen, you can create your own welcome committee in heaven. How would that be? Unrighteous wealth turned into righteous wealth by the way we give. So somebody comes up to you in heaven one day and says, thank you so much for giving to Jesse and Kelly so that they could help translate the word. I got a copy of the, of the Bible from this unfolding word project that they were involved in, and I came to faith in Christ because of that. And I'm in, I'm in heaven today because of that. Somebody will come up to you and say, thank you for giving to Wayne and, and Amy Losey, because they translated the Bible into my language in, in, the, in, in the Asian country where they work, and I was able to come to faith in Christ. They came to my village even. I was the one who died for my faith in that place. And I'm in heaven today because you gave. Thank you for giving. Thank you for giving to the work of Kurt and Melissa Adams who are sharing the gospel with the, with the international students on the campus at UNC. I came to faith in Christ as a result of hearing the gospel from them. Thank you for giving. There's a thousand ways, beloved, that we can do this. But the point is that we're, we're making our money available somewhere where it's going to make the gospel available to someone else. And then we don't know what God's going to do with it. Thank you for giving to the Gideons. They brought a Bible to my place in India. I came to know Christ because of that. Ephesians 4.28 says what? God has given us money so that we may have something to share with anyone in need. 
And what Jesus is looking toward is the end result. Here's the end result. We're going to see some of those in heaven. And I'll tell you what, at that point in time, our only regret, if we can have regret in heaven, which I'm sure we can't permanently, but the time will come at the judgment. We'll just wish we would have given more. You're never going to arrive at the gates of heaven and wish you'd given less. It's not going to happen. B.B. Warfield, great Princeton theologian, he tells us that Christ is our great motive to share with others. And listen to this quote. It's a little bit lengthy, but listen to it. He says, you pray to be made Christ-like. If so, you must be like him in giving. Though he was rich, yet for our sakes, he became poor. He's the example. He goes on and he says, objection number one, my money is my own. Answer, Christ might have said, my blood is my own, my life is my own, and then where should we have been? Objection number two, the poor are undeserving. How many times have you said that? How many times have I said that? Answer, Christ might have said they are wicked rebels. Shall I lay down my life for these? I will give to the good angels. But no, he left the 90 and 9 and came after the lost. He gave his blood for the undeserving. Undeserving. Objection three, the poor may abuse it. Answer, Christ might have said the same. Christ knew that thousands would trample his blood under their feet, yet he gave his own blood. If you would be like Christ, give much, give often, give freely to the vile and poor, the thankless and the undeserving. Christ is glorious and happy, and so will you be. It is not your money I want, but your happiness. Remember his own word, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Prioritize others. You want to create treasure in heaven? Send it on ahead by prioritizing others. Verses 10 to 12, second thing that Jesus asked us to look at here, which is toward ourselves. He's going to tell us to prove ourselves. Now, this is an interesting one. These are critical verses. They're, they're often misunderstood. <clears throat> but what they're doing here is they're showing, how, they're showing us how to think like God instead of how to think like our kind of fallen human nature naturally thinks. Okay, are you with me? How do you think like God about money instead of thinking like you naturally think in your fallen human nature? He's going to give us Three things that he wants us to understand to help us do that. Number one, he wants us to understand money is not momentous. Money is not momentous. Verse 10, one who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in a very little is also dis dishonest in much. Now remember, this whole section is about money. So when he says very little here, what's he talking about? He's talking about money. From God's perspective, money is very little. And it doesn't matter whether you have a whole bunch of it or whether you have almost none of it, it's still very little. Money, from God's perspective, is very little. That's not how we think. That's how God thinks. Money is very little. So if we are to prove ourselves, we need to understand and we need to live as though and we need to believe in our heart of hearts that money is very little. It's not momentous. And then Jesus goes on and he makes the logical conclusion here. If you can't be trusted with very little, in other words, if God can't trust you with the money that he puts in your hands here, how's he going to trust you with more later on? Why would he do that? If he can't trust us to do anything other than spin for ourselves first and then say, well, if there's anything left over, the Lord will get that. That's how we operate. Or if we operate on the principle that, hey, I, you know what? I, I know there's this principle that I should give a tithe of, of at least 10%. That's kind of the minimum, but I can't do that. I've got too many bills to do that. If we're putting ourselves ahead of him and we're saying money is really much, we're just robbing ourselves, beloved. 
Our problem is we make money momentous. It, it's so easy for it to turn us into idolaters. To us, money is very much. To God, money is very little. It's not momentous. So are we living like that? Parents, are, are you teaching your children this? You know, I do these outlines for kids every week. A couple of weeks ago, I asked them a question at the end. They start asking me personal questions, so I start asking them personal questions. Fair is fair, right? So the question this particular week was, when you get your allowance or when you make some money, do you give 10% of that back to the Lord? And then the question was, would you be willing to? <clears throat> Every single one of the kids answered, no, I don't. And yes, I would. I'd be willing to do that. So here's my challenge to you as parents. Teach your children to give. Why would that not be going on as a routine in your home? That we're teaching our children what's important. That we're helping them understand the need to be giving to the Lord's work. We need to show, and you know, it, it's not just a matter of instruction. You, you got to show them by example. You have to see this. You have to know that this is what's going on in your life as well. Glad you came this morning. So far, so far, so good, right? Come on, we'll get there. This is, this is good. Money's not momentous. Second thing, money is not material. Money's not material. I know I'm using the word material there a little differently. Nothing seems more tangible than cold, hard cash, right? But here's the point. From Jesus' perspective, money is not the real thing. The real thing is Coke, right? Everybody knows that, right? But it turns out Coke's not the real thing either, right? Money is not the real thing. It, it doesn't go on forever. It's, it's a poor substitute for reality. It's iron pyrite, you know, substituting for gold. Fool's gold substituting for the real thing. But boy, it's a really good substitute. It just grabs us around the neck and says, I'm it. If you got me, you have no worries. Now, from Jesus' perspective, look at it in verse 11. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you with the true riches? The word means genuine riches. So money is not genuine riches. It's not material in the sense of being an ultimate Reality. Why is that? Well, I mean, that's easy to understand, right? Because money has an expiration date. Just like he said earlier, it's not an eternal reality. That's not what we think, but that's what God thinks. And what God thinks is important. Money is not true riches. We have this, you know, just kind of inbred in us. The more money we got, the better it is, the more genuine our security is, and money is the real thing. But God, Jesus goes back to the same principle. If I can't trust you with this time-stamped imposter, if you won't manage that in my way, according to my rules, why would I give you more later to manage? I can't trust you. We need to prove ourselves worthy of the rewards that he wants to give. But if we want eternal riches, we must learn to handle the temporary ones, you see, according to his rules, according to his principles, according to the reality of not just life, but of eternity. Let me give you a modern parable. A sailor gets shipwrecked on a South Sea island somewhere, right? And he's seized by the, nat by the natives, but he does a couple of magical things, you know? He knows when the rain's gonna come and he can somehow read the stars and he's able to predict certain things and so pretty soon they make him king. This is great. He's just shipwrecked and now he's king and he's got all these riches and whatever he says, you know, people are doing and he's living the life, right? And then he finds out in his culture the king only lasts for one year. He only gets one year and then they send him off to a deserted island over there in the middle of nowhere. So he's got one year to live it up, and then it's all over with. 
Well, he's kind of devastated when he hears this news. Wouldn't we all be? But then he goes just down and he starts thinking about this. And he comes up with a plan. He begins to send some uh, farmers over to that deserted island to plant some seeds. He sends some people over there to live there permanently. He sends some builders over there to build some buildings. And by the time the year is up, he sent enough on ahead, you see, that he can live very comfortably over there on this deserted island. But beloved, that's just like us. Okay, we don't know whether it's a year or 20 years. We just know there's a time frame, right? And we're going to be gone. And if everything we've done is stored up here, it will do us no good. But if we send it on ahead, playing by God's rules. This is what Paul meant when he said, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18, he said, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen, money being one of those, are transient. But the things that are unseen are eternal. Go for those. That's what he's saying. Invest in eternity. Third principle toward ourselves that I see here that Jesus gives us. Money is not Mine. It's not momentous. It's not material. And here's the worst news of all. It's not even mine. It's not mine. Look what, he, look what he says in verse 12. And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's. What other is he talking about? He's talking about God, of course. If you've not been faithful in that which is God's, even though he's given it into your care, who will give you that which is your own? Here is, I think this is perhaps the most telling principle of all. The money you have, it's not yours. That's not what we think. That's the way God thinks. And I'll tell you what, when you, when you really grasp that principle, it'll change your life. When you realize that the money God has given you isn't really yours in the first place you'll realize that it's his and that there's a fiduciary responsibility there, right? When I took some kind of real estate course one time, they told me about that word fiduciary. I'm sure the banker John back there knows all about fiduciary responsibility. What does it mean? It means you have to treat everything that's coming through your hands like it belongs to somebody else because it does. And so Jesus is saying, if you don't treat what is not even yours in the right way, why would God give you more? This is a principle that goes all the way through the Bible. David recognized it way back in 1 Chronicles chapter 29. We won't look at it, but just let me read this for you. 1 Chronicles 29 verse 14. David says, as he's praying, he says, But who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you and of your own have we given to you. David is saying, everything I give back to you already came from you to me to start with. It's yours to begin with. Paul says the same thing almost exactly in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, when he says, what do you have that you did not receive? It's not yours. It's his. Which has all kinds of implications that ties to that, right? It means our money is not my own. It means I'm just a steward of whatever God has given me from the, from the pen in my pocket to the shirt on my back to the car I drive to the home I go to to the money that's in my bank account. It's all his. It's not mine. And the question is, will I, will I be faithful in what he's given me to use? It's not my pen. It's not my shirt. It's not my car. It's not my home. It's not my money. It's his. And so the question is, will I use it faithfully? So what this means is, here's the principle Money is not a possession. Money is a trust. Money is not a possession. Money is a trust. And there's a further implication of that. That means that money is a test. It's a lifelong test. We're all in the middle of the money test every single day of our lives. 
And if you're like me, you do a lot better some days than you do other days. It's, you know, it's really fortunate for me. I have a wife who's a lot better at this test than I am. And I'm very thankful for that. Because I'd stumble more than I do if I didn't have that help. But, but the point is, we're all being tested every day with the possessions that God has put into our control. How will we use them? And what Jesus is saying is here, your ability to function in the kingdom of God, the rank, the position that you will have, the responsibilities that you will have, the, the ability that you will have to enjoy heaven. And I don't know exactly how this works, but he talks about this in Matthew 25, where he says the, the, there will be certain things that we are set over. As, the Bible doesn't say a lot more about what these rewards are. He talks about them in 1 Corinthians 3 as well. But there are, you know, this is where we sort of trust the Lord that it's, this, we, we, we will think it's worth it when we get there, whatever it is. I know a lot of us tend to think, well, just get me to heaven and I'll be happy. Yeah, you will. But there'll also be a sense in which you wish you did a lot more when you get there. The rewards, the ability to enjoy heaven, the ability to enjoy Christ, the ability to function there will be determined by what we do here. We can send on ahead things that will last forever. I mean, that's an incredible statement that the Lord has, is making to us here. This is a test. You know, when I, when I think about this being a test. I th do you remember how once in a while I used to have a test in school and they say, okay, there's going to be a test and I'm going to give you the answers now. You remember that? Once in a while they would do that, once in a rare while. Do you ever do that, Melissa? I don't, do you, ever, you don't do those kind, huh? Okay, well. I love the teacher who would do that once in a while. You know, they'd say, here, the, the test is coming up. Here's the answers. All you got to do is go make sure you know these answers and you'll be able to pass this test. That's what Jesus is doing here. He's saying, if I give you this test on your own, here's what you're going to do on the true-false section. When it says money is momentous, you're going to put true. <clears throat> when it says money is material, you're going to put true. And when you say money is mine, you're going to put true. And those are the wrong answers. The answer is money is not momentous. Money is not material. Money is not mine. That's the right answers. Now, the question isn't just to put the right answer on a piece of paper. The answer is to live that out in the way we live. It's a test. But here's good news. Now, listen to this. You can make money momentous. You can make money material. And you can make money mine. You can make it yours by sending it on ahead. How do I do that? By spending it to further his kingdom, not mine. By spending it and by using it to forward his agenda, not mine. By utilizing every penny I have to somehow bring glory to God, not to me. To think about what he wants more than I'm thinking about what I want. That's a tough test, isn't it? But that's, what he, that's where he's going with all this. Now, is that, so what does that mean? Does it mean you never take a vacation? It doesn't mean that. You know, you can, you can take a vacation and be essentially applying the principle of rest that the Bible talks about all the way through, and you need that. You can also take a vacation, and all you're doing is just consuming it upon your own lust. So you can do a good vacation, a godly one, or you can do an unrighteous wealth one. It depends on where your mindset is, and it depends on how you're really evaluating and following the direction of the Lord in your life. Does it mean you never buy a new car? Of course not. But it means you're looking at how is, how is this going to be used to further God's plan and kingdom for me? How can I accomplish my mission better with this than I could without it? Everything is looked at from the framework of, of how God looks at this. Do you see? I mean, it's not that difficult. But our tendency is to look at all of it from, this, from the standpoint of our own ease and comfort, right? It's not that God wants us to be uneasy or uncomfortable, but he wants us to do it within the framework of completing the mission that he's given us to do, each one of us uniquely and individually. 
It's a test. It's an ongoing test. And every, here's the point, because I think many people miss this. They go, okay, the only, the only way I invest in heaven is whatever I give to church or whatever I give to some missionary or, you know, whatever, that two or three percent. Oh, please, don't stop at two or three percent. That's where everybody stops. That's the average giving in evangelical circles. The minimum is 10, beloved. Not out of sense of duty, but out of a joy that you can give it. Anyway, what, the, the point is, we, we think that's, that's the part That's the part that's getting me eternal reward in heaven, right? Wrong. Every penny we spend can be to the glory of God and should be to the glory of God, right? Every single one. That's what he's looking for because it's his. It's not mine. Somebody has said incredible wealth is an income of at least $5,000 a year more than what your wife's sister's husband makes. <laughs> I can't even follow that, let alone know whether it's true or not. But I'll tell you what, I know this. I know this, incredible wealth is the money that we have sanctified and sent on ahead. That's incredible wealth. Turned unrighteous wealth into righteous wealth and sent it on ahead to lay it up in the kingdom of God. And every cent that we spend can be that way. if we're following the Lord. So there's our test, prove ourselves. The third point here in verse 13 is we need to prize God. We need to prize God. Our treasure must be Him, see, ultimately. Our ultimate treasure must be God. Money is not momentous, but God is. And we need to live like that. That's the point of verse 13. No servant can serve two masters. For for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man and money. If If there's one lie that's been foisted on kind of 21st century American evangelicalism, it's this, you can have both God and money. That's right. You can have both. Well, listen, you can have both, but you can't have both in position number one. We kind of think of it this way. Money, material wealth, success in life is a sign of God's blessing. Well, it may well be, but it's not automatically that way, beloved. God may bless you just as much and you have nothing and you can be blessed by God. We have so misunderstood and so misconstrued this whole concept. And so we go out and make a lot of money in our own fleshly effort and because we just you know, know, know the right tricks and we got our ticket, but we, we blame it on God and say, God's the one who did this for me. We're just being selfishly lying. We don't really prize God. We, pl- we prize his gifts. You know what? That, that's, isn't that exactly what they did in Romans 1 where Paul says, you know, they worship, the crea- cre- they worship the creation rather than the creator? That's what we do when we prize the blessing rather than the blesser. See, th- to prize God is to say it doesn't matter if you make me rich or not. I'm going to love you. It doesn't matter whether you give me what I think is my heart's desire or not. I want my heart to line up with yours. You're the one I prize. You're the one I love. You're the one I want to serve. That's where Jesus is going with this. And he's recognizing that for for so many of us, we prize the money instead of prizing the Lord. And so the love of money has taken us down the wrong road. And Jesus is saying, no, you can't have both. You know, that, that's exactly why he told the rich young ruler, go out and sell everything you got and give it away. Why? Because that's the very thing that was standing in that man's way of coming to Christ, right? It was his idol. It was his idol. And so Jesus says, you need to give that away. That's the, that's, but, 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 but we've convinced ourselves, no, I can have God and I can have money too and I can have them both at the same level. No, you can't. Right now, today, as you sit here in this place, 
One or the other is on top. And what Jesus is doing by means of this message today is asking you, which one is it? Is it me or is it money? Which is the most important to you? We think we call the shots. We think that we, you know, vacillate between God and money and we can handle both. And God, Jesus is saying, listen, I got news for you. You don't run anything. You're a slave. You're either a slave to God or you're a slave to money. The only choice you have is which one are you going to be a slave to? But in either case, you're not calling the shots. Either God is or money is. Which is it? That's a, that's a pretty big challenge, isn't it? That he set in front of us. What drives you? Who are you serving? Here's a personal illustration this morning. I, I, I'm, I'm always reluctant to do this. I am not... I, 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 don't, I don't want to glorify my family. I don't want to glorify my mom and dad. I love them dearly. They were wonderful, but they were just as flawed as anybody sitting here today. I could tell you the flaws, but I can tell you their hearts were about as pure as anybody I ever knew. On March 20th, 1958, my sister Mary was born, seventh of what became 11 children. She was the first girl. I'll tell you something about why I am the way I am. And a lot of boys in that family. Mary was born. Now, I didn't always know how much mom and dad were making, but at that point in time, for some reason, I did. I remember this very well. Dad was making $320 a month. Now, even in 1958, that wasn't very much money <laughs> to feed seven kids, nine mouths all together, shoe everybody, because we were wearing out shoes about once a, once a month on the gravel and sand that we played on. I mean, it was tough times although we didn't, we didn't really know it. But here comes this new mouth to feed, $320 a month. You know what I know about my mom and dad, though? I know that the first $32 every month before any other check got written, because I saw them write it month after month, and sometimes I was the one that got to put it in the offering plate on Sunday. I knew that the first 10% went to God. It went to God before any shoes were bought, it went to God before any food was bought. It went to God before anything else was done. Now, beloved, that's the way to live. That's the way to live. And that's what Jesus is telling us here. I know there are priorities. I know if you sit down with a budget and work it out, it's not going to allow you to give 10%. Give it anyway. I don't care if it's a church or not. With my folks, it was most, a lot of it went to the church. Some of it went to my Uncle Gene. It was a missionary in Africa, Wayne's brother. But it went to the Lord's work. And it had an impact that went way beyond just the money. My brother John was here last September, right? And, and we did a seminar on parenting. And... Some of you made it, some of you didn't. If you, if you didn't, and if you're a parent, or even if you're a grandparent, you need to get online, and you need to listen to those videos. He's much more eloquent than I. He, he explains some things much more better than I ever could, and you need to hear them. But one of the things he said was this. He said, most parents are more concerned about where their, where their children are going to college than they are where they're going to spend eternity. You need to think about that. You need to think about that. We've seen so many kids go off to secular college, and, I, and I'm not saying secular colleges are wrong, okay? But if your child isn't prepared for a secular college, there are going to be people in the science class and in the biology class and the philosophy class that are going to run your kids around the axle, and, they're going to, and you're going to wonder, why don't they have the faith I have? Because you paid for them to go to a hellish place, that's why, without preparing them. Say so you're on a soapbox, right? <laughs> Beloved, these are eternal issues we're dealing with here. When I got out of high school, and this was, this was my decision, but my counselors were very disappointed because I wouldn't consider going to one of the elite schools in California, one of the Ivy League schools back in the East Coast. They thought I had the grades and the other requirements that I could do that. And I was determined to head off to a Bible college. I was determined to do that because of what I'd seen in my folks' life. 
And here's a really interesting thing. My life is way more failure than is success. Any of you know a little bit of the history, you know that. I've been very honest with you about that. I'm very grateful. I'm, I'm a trophy of God's grace to even be standing here this morning, believe me. But, but here's one thing I can tell you. I went off to that Bible college, but a few years later, even though I didn't go to those elite colleges, I was hiring MBAs and PhDs from those elite colleges to come to work for me. A Christian worldview is way more important than anything else you're going to give your kids by way of education. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> I don't feel quite so alone. I tell you this with, with, as, with as much heart as I can because, because sometimes I'm the one who has to deal with trying to pick up the pieces because we've experienced it in our own family. We know what it is to put kids in a place where they can lose their faith without preparing them ahead of time. I went to Bible college thinking I would do that for a couple of years and then go do something else. Now, as it turned out, the Lord directed my life to go there for eight years, eight long years, uh, with several degrees before I got done, but that's, that's what the Lord wanted. I, you know, I, I often think, as I'm hiring a guy from Harvard, Law, Harvard Business School, God must have been sitting in heaven laughing. Look what I did with McNeff. He's out there hiring this guy who knows 10 times as much as he does. That's just God. I don't know how to get into your, I don't know how to get into your, the way you think to cause you to realize that the priorities you establish now for those lives that are in your hands that are going to be forever lives that you're going to answer for. Treat them carefully. And you know, for me, it all went back to watching mom and dad be faithful. It went back to watching them give the $300 a month that I knew they didn't have to give but that's the first thing that ever went out. It taught me that money is not momentous, God is. And God has proven that in my life over and over again. It taught me that now is not momentous, eternity is. I just want you to learn that same lesson. I want us to learn it together. I want us to go down this road. Beloved, I want us to reach not for the stars. That's not nearly far enough. I want us to reach into heaven. And I want us to send it on there because God says where your treasure is, where your, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That's where our heart needs to be. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. Forgive my over-exuberance. And uh, if in any way it has been offensive, I pray that you'll forgive that. Uh, you know that it comes from a heart that is just anxious that we be faithful in how we set priorities in our families, in how we lead them, and how we not only instruct them, but how we provide examples to them so that we are faithful to what you have placed in our hands as stewards. Help us to realize none of it belongs to us. It all belongs to you. And we will soon, very, very, very soon give account. Not only for every idle word, but for every nickel, every dime, every penny. We will give account. So Lord, help us to be faithful. Not because we have to. Not because it's a duty. But because we love the, the God of glory who has given everything for us so that we could have eternal life. This wouldn't even be an issue if you hadn't come and given your life on our behalf. Thank you. Thank you for your word. Lord, let it take root in our hearts, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.